Amen. Again, welcome to our communion service, our Sunday service here at Calvary Chapel Northwest. It's always an honor and a privilege to, to be here with you. I don't know about you all, but during the week, you know, you're out there, you're in the world, you're, you're at your jobs, you're, you're rubbing shoulders and elbows with the world, and you get dirty. It's, it's, it's mucky out there, right? You need to be constantly cleansed. But on Sunday, on Wednesday, we get to come into the house of God. We get to be surrounded by the people of God, you know. It's just like, ah, I'm safe here, Lord. You know, we just get to receive his blessings. I uh, just want to um, add to an announcement that was already made, and that is about our Good Friday service that will be here on, on Good Friday. It's a special service, and what we do is we have a cross here at the side uh, at the beginning of the service. So we, we'll ask you to come early. The lights are down low. Soft music is playing. It's a somber uh, mood. And we have, we have um, little pieces of paper on the back, and here at the cross, someone will assist you. We have nails and a hammer. And that paper is there for you to write Whatever it is that you want to nail to the cross, whatever, it could be a sin, it could be a struggle, it could be whatever, you want to nail to that cross, you nail it to that cross on Friday. No one is ever going to see what you wrote on that paper. And then for our Easter service on Sunday morning, all of those things are going to be gone. It symbolizes that we can leave whatever issue we have at the cross. I stole that from Calvary Chapel, San Antonio. I can't tell you how many things that I've nailed to that cross over many, many years that are no longer in my life by the grace of God. So that, that is what will be happening on a Good Friday. But today we are continuing our study through the book of John, the Gospel of John. And our text is John chapter 2, verse 18 through chapter 3. Verse 15, so if you would like to turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along with me as I read our text, starting in John 2, 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel 
and do not know these things. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you as we approach this tremendous passage of Scripture. Lord, my prayer is that you would tenderize each heart that is listening, dear God, those that are here in the sanctuary, those who are listening online, that, Lord, you will prepare our hearts to receive from you, that, Lord, you would use my voice, God, to communicate your word, Lord God, effectively, the message that you want heard today, that your Holy Spirit can take and use in the lives of the hearers to draw each person individually to the place that you desire them to be in their relationship with you. There may be some, Lord, that have yet to come into a personal relationship with you. For them, Lord God, I pray that today would be the day that they finally open their heart and surrender to you and are born again. For others, Lord God, that may know you but have allowed distance to come between their relationship with you and them, I pray, Lord, that they will be renewed and refreshed in you and drawn to a closer and more intimate walk with you. Whatever your will is, God, that is what we want. So we surrender this service to you, Lord, and to your Holy Spirit to have his way as he speaks not of himself but he brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. It is for his sake we pray. Amen. Our text begins in verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? When John speaks of the Jews, he is generally speaking about the religious and political leaders of the Jewish nation. These generally are not nice people. For the most part, they are usually found to be in conflict with Jesus. Their problem is the same one that many people who have power and authority have. You see, their desire is not to fulfill the purpose of being in a position of authority, which is to serve the people. They, like many others in authority, simply want to maintain their power. They, they want to be highly regarded and thought of well by the people. Of course, they are not all bad. There are some notable exceptions, and we will meet one of those exceptions in our study today. But they are questioning Jesus. Why are you doing these things? What things? If you recall from our study last week, the last thing we looked at, Jesus had made a whip, and he drove out those that were conducting business in God's house in the temple, those that were seeking financial gain, rather seeking the spiritual welfare of the people. Now the leaders want to know what Jesus' authority was to do such a thing. The inquiry is actually a legitimate inquiry. These Jewish leaders run the temple. They are the ones that are in charge of the temple. They have the authority. And here comes Jesus. Jesus is angry at the unrighteousness which he is seeing in his father's house. And he clearly asserts his authority by driving them out and declaring 
You shall not make my father's house a den of thieves. It is a house of prayer. So these leaders are like, who's this guy think he is? Right? Where is he coming from? You see, in the Jewish mind, a true prophet of God would be able to perform a miracle. So they are asking for one as a sign of his authority. And of course, Jesus could have performed a miracle to demonstrate that he was, in fact, the ultimate authority. But Jesus knew the hearts of these people. If they wanted a sign, he would give them the definitive sign. Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That is the sign that proves beyond the shadow of any doubt who Jesus is and what is his authority. Now, of course, Jesus knew that the Jews would have absolutely no clue as to what he was talking about. Verse 20. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? No clue. Realistically, no one would have understood what Jesus was talking about when he made that statement. Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. See, even Jesus' disciples didn't understand this reference at that moment. They wouldn't understand until after Jesus' death and resurrection because Jesus' statement wasn't meant to be understood at that moment. Jesus would do many, many miracles, making it clear who he was. And if the Jews truly wanted to know him, they would have many opportunities. Case in point is verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Jesus performed many signs which validated who he was and from whence he came. But he had no desire to do these things for the Jewish leaders that questioned him. And the next two verses tell us why. Verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew what was in the hearts of those Jewish leaders. He knew that they had no desire to receive him, regardless of what proof he could demonstrate. They would never accept him, no matter what. They were not honest people. Their hearts were not open to change. Although they were the religious leaders and they were supposed to, to be looking for their Messiah. They were very comfortable in their roles and in their lives. They would only accept someone who would come to validate them and fit into their preconceived mold of what they wanted their Messiah to be. And this is not uncommon. See, people don't want to change. People don't want to be conformed into God's will, they want the world and everyone around them to conform to their will. That's human nature. That's the sin nature. Jesus knew what was in their hearts, and he knows what's in my heart. He knows what's in your heart. The question is, are you willing to receive God's authority as revealed in his word, the Bible? Are you willing to take Jesus as he is, as he is revealed in God's word, the Bible? Or are you like far too many people seeking to make God after your own image, 
refusing to accept God's word as the final authority in your life. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Apostle Paul is speaking. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. This was Paul's charge to Pastor Timothy. This is my charge. This is my mission. This is what I do when I stand in the pulpit. This is what I do when I counsel. This is what I do when I speak to friends, family, and acquaintances. This is my charge, but not mine alone. It's also yours. We are to proclaim God's word. We are to speak the truth in love. You see, only the truth will set a person free from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Only the truth will free someone from self and selfishness. Continuing in Timothy, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. For the time will come. That time is here. That time is now. There are so, so many that refuse simply to take God at his word. Why? Because God's word runs counter to what they want to do, what they want to believe, how they want to act. So what do they do? They find someone to scratch those itching ears and tell them exactly what they want to hear. In this day and age of the Internet, you can always find someone to agree with you. Whatever it is you want to believe, you can find someone to validate that belief. The problem is that when what you believe is not in a line with God's word, you're on dangerous ground. You need to allow Romans 3, 4 to be ingrained in your heart, your mind, and in your spirit. Romans 3, 4 says, certainly not, indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Do you want to be justified in your words? Do you want to be justified and validated when you are judged? Then make sure that whatever you are hearing, whatever you are thinking, whatever you are believing, is lined up with God's word. If it's not, it must be rejected. Let God be true and every man a liar. There's only one truth. It's God's truth. That's it. Chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This is the exception that I was talking about. All the Pharisees aren't bad. We have Nicodemus. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. First thing I wonder is why is Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night under the cover of darkness? Is he afraid what his fellow Pharisees might think? 
Maybe he had a full schedule and he could only make it at night. I don't know. Maybe it's one or both of these things. But he's coming to Jesus at night. But Nicodemus at least recognizes the truth that is before his eyes. Because he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus is an honest man. He recognizes Jesus' credentials based on what he has witnessed. And now he has come to hear what this teacher come from God has to say. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes straight to the heart of the issue. Jesus knows where Nicodemus is in his life. He knows what Nicodemus is lacking. Jesus keeps the main thing, the main thing. Nicodemus, you said that you know that I am a teacher come from God. Well, here is the message from God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is the main thing. There is nothing more important to a living human being than this. For if a person is not born again, according to Jesus, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And if you cannot see the kingdom of God, if you cannot enter into the kingdom of God, there is only one alternative, and that is an eternity in hell. And this is why Jesus came. This is why Jesus left his home in glory to travel through the birth canal of a virgin teenage girl and be born into this world in order to give his sacrifice, his life, a sacrifice for our sin. God is love. God does not want any to end up spending an eternity in hell. He wants all to spend eternity in glory with him. But in order to do so, you must be born again. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? and be born. Nicodemus' mind has been blown. This phrase has never been coined before. Jesus is talking about being born again, and he doesn't understand how this is possible. I'm a grown man. How can, can I get back in my mother's womb and be born again? Verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says there's two births. You must be born of water and the spirit. The first birth is water. The second is born of the spirit. Verse 6, Jesus goes on, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The first birth, born of water, is being born of the flesh. A, mother's ca a mother carries her child in an amniotic sac. When it's time to give birth, what happens? Her water breaks. The child is literally born of water. So the first condition of seeing the kingdom of heaven is that you must be a human. You must have gone through natural birth. Fallen angels, demons who have rebelled against God, cannot be born again. They don't meet the first condition. They were never born of the Spirit. This applies only to the human race. So if you're listening to this message and you're human, you qualify. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The second birth is critical. You must be born of the Spirit. Jesus explains, verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Just as you cannot see the wind with your eyes, but you can hear it, and you can see the effect of the wind, so it is with the Spirit of God. You can hear the Spirit of God even though you cannot hear or see Him. Open your Bibles and read it. You're hearing the Spirit of God. As you listen to me proclaiming God's Word, you're hearing the Spirit of God. When that small, still voice speaks to your heart and mind, and it is in line with God's Word, you are hearing the Spirit of God. I want you to be careful, though, when you're hearing that small, still voice, because there's a lot of voices that are not the Spirit of God. There are a lot of deceiving spirits that are in the world. There is a lot of deception, and that's why God has given us His Word his inerrant, infallible word to base our lives on. See, we cannot trust in our feelings. We cannot trust our emotions. We cannot trust our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can only trust and rely on God's word. Let God be true and every man a liar. We can't see the spirit, but we can hear him. We can't see the wind, but we can see its effects. Just as we cannot see the spirit of God, but we can see him working in our lives and working in the lives of others. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any one is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is what happens the moment that we are born again. God's Spirit births us into Jesus Christ, and just as in natural birth, when a baby is born, there are vital signs, signs of life. When we are born into Jesus, there are spiritual signs of life. We are changed. We become new. All things have passed away. We have different desires. We don't want to sin against God anymore. We want to serve God. We hunger for the word of God. We want to do God's will. All things have passed away. This is the sign of life. This is a sign of being born again. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus is being direct with Nicodemus. He's saying, you are the teacher of Israel. You are the one that they have to rely on, and you don't know about these heavenly things. I'm testifying to you these things because I am the one who was in heaven. I am the one who came down from heaven. I am the one who will return to heaven. I'm speaking to you the words of life. Nicodemus. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must 
the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is speaking of being born again. But for Nicodemus, being born again is still a future thing. It's not available yet because being born again first starts with the work that Jesus must accomplish on the cross. Jesus must be crucified, lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness in order for a person to be born again. And what Jesus is referencing is what happened to the Israelites in the desert. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. What's going on here? The people are complaining. They're complaining against God, and they're complaining against Moses. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? They were slaves in Egypt. They were being whipped every day. They had a heavy load in Egypt. They had taskmasters that didn't care anything about their lives. God delivered them through miraculous means. Now they're in the desert, and they're complaining. Why'd you take us out of Egypt? We don't have any food here. We don't have any water. They're complaining against Moses. God is feeding them supernaturally from heaven with manna. And they're like, yeah, we're tired of this stuff, man. We loathe this bread. You're feeding us miraculously, but you know what? We miss the onions and the leeks back in Egypt. How does God respond? Verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. When we rebel against God, the wages of sin is death. We might be born again, and we might be saved from eternal death, but still in our lives, even as believers, if we rebel against God, we're going to experience death in minute ways. We're going to experience separation from God. We're going to experience the lack of God's blessings and protection in our life. The wages of sin is death. People are dying. Verse 7, therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Praise God, repentance, right? If God puts his heavy hand on you, repentance is what is needed. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. God is already pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ. God is already giving an example that the Savior is going to come. He didn't simply take away the serpents. God told Moses to do something. 
make a brazen serpent, put it on a pole, lift it up. Tell the people if they look at it, then they will be saved. People are still getting bitten, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But there's a serpent there. Moses tells the people, they pray for us, Moses. You just got to look at this brazen serpent. Those that looked were saved. What if they didn't believe Moses? Oh, that's stupid. That makes no sense, right? That makes no sense, Moses. I'm not looking at no stupid serpent. You're going to die, right? Jesus died for my sins? That makes no sense. How could one man die for the... Makes no sense. If you don't believe, if you can't do the simple thing that God has asked in order for you to receive his gift of salvation, you will die in your sins. The last verse of our study, verse 15 says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus tells Nicodemus that a person must be born again or he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Being born again is precipitated on believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's looking to that serpent. As Jesus was, as that serpent was lifted up, Jesus must be lifted up and we must believe on on him. This is part one of two, maybe three. We're going to get into what it means to believe on Jesus next week because that is critical. There are so many people that say they believe, but they don't believe. They don't understand what it truly means to believe on Jesus. It's not just a, a, a passing belief. It's not just intellectually believing. Oh, yeah, I believe that. That's not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it changes you. The belief is severe. It is intense. That is what biblical faith is. It changes you. Something miraculous happens in your life at the spiritual level, and you are born again when you believe. Trust me, there are millions of people out there that will tell you that they believe in Jesus. And many, the Bible says, many, many at Judgment Day will be saying, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that and the other in your name? And Jesus is going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. Many think that they believe, but they don't believe. But God is faithful. God's not trying to hide his word from anyone. It is clear. That's what we're out proclaiming every day. If anyone truly wants to know the truth, they can know the truth. And we will continue to proclaim the truth of God's word. Please bow and pray with me. Father, we come into your presence. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus, who shed his blood on Calvary's cross, dear God. Before, Lord, we come to your table of communion, which is a family celebration, Lord. It is for every person that knows you as their Savior. If you know Jesus as your Savior and you're here today, we invite you to take part in the Lord's Supper. But if by chance there is anyone here that has yet to make that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity now. Jesus gave his life for you. And all you need to do is trust him as your Savior. Receive him in your life as Lord, and you too will be born again. And you will be the guest of honor at Jesus' table. If there's any here that need to receive Jesus, I'm going to ask you that you just lift your hand. I will acknowledge it and 
pray with you to receive Jesus as your Savior. Do we have any here today that need to be born again? Any? If you're listening online, maybe you have never fully understood what it means to be born again. And God's Spirit has spoken to you. You believe the facts about Jesus, that he came, he died on a cross, he was buried, he rose the third day, he ascended into heaven. But has that belief ever changed your life? If not, maybe you haven't believed with saving faith. Saving faith means that you are willing to repent. That means turn away from your own ways and receive what God has for you. Receive His way, surrendering completely to Him. If you're willing to do that, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I invite you to receive Him as your Savior. A simple prayer, Lord Jesus, save me. I give my entire self to you. Be my Lord. A prayer like that from the heart will result in salvation and you will know that you are saved. The Spirit of God will bear witness with your spirit that you are his child. Lord, we love you. So, Lord, we come to your table now and we ask God that you continue to bless us, continue to fill this place with your presence and be glorified in your precious name. Amen. Amen. The ushers are passing out the elements now. giving me that nasty one, man. I don't want that. Man. We don't use those no more. <laughs> you have two elements in your hand. You have the, the juice and the, and the bread. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was having the Passover meal with his disciples. The Last Supper, we call it. Knowing that he himself was that Passover lamb. Jesus broke the bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. What Jesus was saying was the broken bread represented his body. It wasn't his body. It didn't become his body. It was a representation of his body. Jesus was still in his body. The bread doesn't become Jesus' body. There's nothing magical about the bread. It represents Jesus' body, which was broken that day. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that he was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes, we are healed. It tells us that it pleased God to crush his own son for us. You see, sin has a penalty. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And each and every one of us, if you are honest, has sinned. We are all sinners, and that price had to be paid. You see, God is holy, and God cannot have fellowship with a sinful being. So he had to deal with our sin in the most severe manner because God is a righteous judge. Jesus bore our sin, and he took the wrath of God on our sin. And because we have received Jesus and received his sacrifice on our behalves, we are free from the penalty of sin. And that's what we're here to celebrate. Jesus said, my body is broken for you. He says, as often as you take this, do it in remembrance of me. It's so easy to remember what our Savior did for us. He purchased our salvation. We couldn't do it for ourselves. So he came and he did it. And we thank Jesus. We love you, Lord. Let's take and eat the bread.
In the same manner, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. The new covenant. I love that. Thank you, Jesus, that I was born in the 60s. The new covenant. The old covenant was tough, right? You had all those sacrifices. You had to obey the law, you know, and the, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So your conscience was never purged. But Jesus came and he shed his blood, the new covenant. Not only is our sins forgiven, but all the guilt is gone. We live in the age of grace where when we step out of line and the Holy Spirit convicts us, we can immediately get right with God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can keep that short account with God and our conscience can be pure because he shed his blood, the blood of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. Jesus told his disciples, he says, this is the last time I will drink from the vine with you. The next time I drink with you will be in my Father's kingdom. The next time we drink in Jesus' presence, it will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I look forward to that marriage supper. I hope it happens soon. I'm hungry right now. I'm looking for Jesus every day. The world is dark and it's getting darker the spiritual warfare is intense and getting more intense, and Jesus is coming back soon. But this is the blood of the new covenant that saves all who will come to Jesus in faith. And we will always remember. He said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Jesus, we thank you for your body and your blood, which you shed on Calvary's cross to purchase our salvation just as the song we sang before we started our message Lord nothing else you don't owe us anything Lord you have given us already more than we deserve but yet your word tells us that I have not seen nor ear heard neither has even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love us. We can't imagine that you have even more for us, Lord, that you have made us joint heirs with Jesus. All we can say is thank you, Lord. We love you, and we want to give you our lives because we love you. So use us, Lord, for your glory as we surrender all to you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Please stand and worship with us one final time before we dismiss.